Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you're very welcome to our webinar here this morning. Uh, it's a kind of a, a Let's Talk Dairy combined with a Resilience for Dairy uh, webinar. So in addition to our Irish uh, participants this morning, we're hoping to attract an audience from ac across Europe. And they're well aware that we'll be speaking English here this morning. In case anyone is wondering how our European farmer is going to um, understand what's going on. So um, in terms of the objective of the webinar, we're, we're going to talk to Ned Dunphy. Ned is a lead trainer with the Farm Relief Services in County Waterford, and he's over 40 years experience in terms of working with uh, lameness and treating lameness in dairy cows on Irish grazing systems over the last number of years. So my name is George Ramsbottom and I work with Chagas. I've been with Chagas for about 30 years at this stage. And this is the first in a series of three webinars that will focus on lameness in grazing dairy cows. So today we're joined by Ned. Next week we're joined by Natasha Brown, who's completed a PhD in the subject of lameness in dairy cows in Ireland. And the following week we'll be joined by Paul Maher, who's a PhD candidate He's done a lot of uh, a, a large assessment on uh, roadways for dairy cows. He's looking at the quality of those roads, how to assess them, and the efficiency with which they're uh, operating on, on farms. So these are three webinars over the next uh, three weeks that are worthwhile uh, tuning in for. So, Ned, without further ado, I'd like to, to welcome you to our webinar here this morning. And uh, maybe you'd introduce yourself and the topic that you're talking about. Uh, thanks, George. Um, Ned Dunphy is my name. As George said, I'm 40 years experience at, at, um, at, at this business and dealing with lame cows. Um, so what, what we want to talk today about is lameness in the grazing dairy cows, which I suppose in Ireland is becoming, um, you know, more and more common dairy cows. So just I go on to my first slide. The three topics that we will discuss today is what is lameness and why it's important, the common cause of lameness in the grazing herd, and what we can do to help maybe reduce that level of lameness in the health, what you as a farmer can do. So we we'll start off by first of all, my first slide, and I'll ask the question, what is lameness? And I suppose to know how to deal with lameness in your health, you have to understand what is lameness. And lameness is damage to the shoe or the hoof and the skin around the hoof. Now, what I'm going to do is I actually have a prop here, and the prop here is actually of, of a cow's shoe or hoof. Now, if this shoe gets damaged, which it protects the hoof, if it gets damaged, I mean, the cow can't go down to the local duns or go down to the local shoe, shoe shop and, you know, change it. She has to live with it. And she's dependent either on the vet or the foot trimmer or the farmer to deal with it and make it better. And if this shoe is allowed, you know, get worse, it can become chronic and you can end up with maybe a cold cow. So I suppose... Just to explain what the shoe is, the shoe is made up of three distinct parts. First of all, it's made up of here, what we can see here is, is the, the wall. And the wall actually grows here from the hairline. Grows from the hairline, the same as the cutex in your nails. Your nails grow from the cutex. So that grows down from the hairline. The second part here is actually the sole. So if we look at the sole here, the sole, the sole grows from what we call the creek or the flesh in the sole of the claw near the bone. And the third, I suppose, important part of this shoe or this hoof is actually the white line. And the white line, I see it here, it's actually shown back here, but it's actually the white line. And this is actually a welded junction. And this is a welded junction that actually welds, you could say, the wall and the sole together. And this is often a weak, the weakest part of the, the, the hoof, simply because it's the weld. And as we all know, a weld is the much easiest part to break in anything. Another thing to understand about the hoof is the hoof grows at the rate, like it's not very thick, it's only 10, I suppose, 8 to 10 mil thick. And it grows really at the rate of 1 mil per week or 5 mil per month, and it wears at the same rate. And sometimes, depending on what we call maybe the influence, what influences lameness, the environmental factors. And the environmental factors can be when cows work on the roadway, especially grazing, grazing cows, they have to walk long distances. Sometimes the wear can be exceed the growth. So you end up with tin soles, you end up with, I suppose, tin white lines, 
and you end up with stone damage in those white lines and consequently you end up with lameness. The other factor that can cause the environment factor is housing. When cows are inside in, in housing, if they haven't enough cubicles and they stand, they are standing a lot, they can end up with sore bruising and they can also end up with what we call uh, sore ulcers. The, another, another factor that probably influences lameness is the disease factor. And the disease factor really is a disease called digital dermatitis, which our international, I suppose, participants will, will know. In Ireland, we know it as Martellao disease, which was first, I suppose, discovered back in 1977 by a guy called Martellao. He was actually um, uh, an Italian. And the first cases of Martellao in Ireland was in about 88, it was discovered in Cork, and it, it, it came in really through, through animals being brought in. Now, I suppose the next question I suppose we need to ask is, why, why is lameness important? Well, lameness is important from a couple of different factors. From number one, it's, it's a painful disease. And I suppose it really restricts how the cow moves. It restricts how much the cows eat. It, it, it restricts, I suppose, the level of, of production and maybe her condition as well. I suppose another factor, and I suppose we, we all need to look at as farmers, is money in our pocket. So the average cost of a lame cow done, was searched done back in 2004, which was more than 20 years ago, when milk was at 30 centimeters or maybe less, was 300 euros per cow. That is the average cost. Some levels of lameness might only cost 60 or 70 euros. Some levels of lameness, like solo ulcers, could cost you five or 600 euros. So they actually took the average cost of the cow. And they spoke into both direct and indirect costs. And like based on maybe a uh, hundred cow had, you could be looking at costs of anything from ten to twelve thousand, um, you know, on your health, you know, related to lameness. And I suppose the last issue, and I think it's a big issue, especially here in Ireland, because we regard ourselves as a very green um, country from the point of view of of our production. Um, and like you know, at the end of the day, if the housewife goes into either Duns or maybe Tesco's or you know into the shop mall to buy a pint of milk. And uh, if she realized, look at that, this, this pint of milk or this milk was one produced from, in a gallon. It was produced from a cow and maybe, you know, a cow that was lame, would she be as inclined to buy that milk? And I think that's an important point. You know, the, the perception out there, and we need to keep the perception correct. And that's why lameness is so important, that we need to drive down lameness and reduce the level of lameness in our health. So going on to my next slide here, and. What I want to talk about is the three common causes in the grazing hound. Now, I suppose the three common causes, first of all, white line disease, then we have sole ulcers, and we have the disease called digital dermatitis or martillaire disease. Now, I start off by talking about, I suppose, white line disease. Now, if we, if we look at this, and if you see my cursor here on my right hand side, we have every cow has, I suppose, eight claws. She has an inner claw and an outer claw. And on the right hand side there, we, we can see it's our inner claw. And the inner claw in this case is only carrying maybe 30% of the weight. If I move my cursor over to my, the left hand side of that slide, we can see the outer claw. And the outer claw is probably carrying 70% of the weight. Now, because of this, the outer claw is being used more and it tends to get more damaged. So if we look at what happens maybe if this cow is out walking on a poor enough roadway or in wet conditions on a roadway or walking a long distance and she's been pushed along. You can get what we call white line separation. And like in, in this slide here, you can see where, where I have the cursor down here where stones will get into the white line, push up along, cause an infection and cause a drop in this hoop. And this is very, very painful. And this, this car or this, this, this actually hoof is damaged and this white line is damaged. And when this white line is damaged, something needs to be done about it. Mm. So how do we deal with this problem? You can see there's two, two pictures here. Of, uh, on my left is, I suppose, a cow that was lifted. And uh, the very first thing we do is we use using the five, what we call the five-step Dutch method. Now, as I spoke in, in the previous slide, you have two claws, one carrying too much weight. The very first thing we need to do is level both claws, so both claws, are carrying equally amount of weight. Automatically, you're reducing the stress on the affected car. That's the first thing. The second thing we need to do uh, is we need to remove 
this is the white line here, as you can see with my cursor. And we need to remove any what we call loose horn or under own horn, which I've done here. And you can see that that has um that that is probably the end result from the point of view of having uh, both claws the same height. You have less pressure on the, 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 the area problem, and this will allow the cow to cure. In the case where you can't get enough height in the soft claw, you can actually apply a block, which I'll show you in the next slide. So on our next slide here, this is a cow I did there some months ago. When I lifted the cow, she was extremely lame. And you can see here with my cursor where there is a drop there coming out on the white line, there's white line damage. I moved along and I moved all the underrun horn in the hoof and I applied a block on the good claw. So the idea of the block is to put it on the good claw to allow it to rest. Because as we all know, the very best form of cure is rest. So if you allow something to rest, I spoke to this farmer three or four days later, <clears throat> and his answer was, oh, she's flying. You know, he could hardly pick her out. You know, from being a very, very lame cow to coming back here and, and, and improve, improve on this. So that's how we deal with, I suppose, issues with white line disease. Now, the next one I talk is about soul ulcers. And soul ulcers predominantly occur uh, when the cows are indoors. When the cows are indoors, maybe with not enough of cubicles, maybe with not, not enough of feed space, you end up with the cows standing more, end up with, with bruising in the soil, especially in this area here. This area here is what we call the typical spot. And this area here, we can see in this, in this, in this slide where this cow had um, a soil ulcer, what she was doing, the very first step we do is we use, we use the five step Dutch method to get both of the claws the same height. So they're both carrying, first of all, the same amount of weight. And the next step is we, we remove what we call any under one horn. And on the slide here on the right hand side, we have we have removed the under one horn and we've applied a block. And again, in the case of soul ulcers, soul ulcers might take eight to 10 weeks to occur. They could take 10 to 12 weeks to cure. So, I mean, they're slow to occur and they're slow to cure. So, I mean, they can be having actually a huge cost you know, to you or to the farmer when they when they call. And often with soil ulcers, you can get them in both feet. There are two different cows, Ned, isn't that correct? In this so they're, they're two different cows, but, but just kind of indicating that that uh, you know uh, you know what soil ulcers look like and what you can do to treat them. And then in the slide on the left, would you apply a claw on the inner horn on the inner hoof on that one there? Not, of course, yeah, we'd apply a block, but I, I just took this as an example, but that would the end result. When that cow would be finished, we would actually have a block in it. I just wanted to show maybe um, a, a claw without a block and a claw with a block. So, okay. But the, but the block and is I, actually vital in, in George in a situation where there's a soul also because you know you need the cow needs to rest and the cow needs to improve. And if you don't apply a block or there's not a block put on, you know you might get the same result. And as well as that, especially I suppose in grazing in grazing systems, just because you put on a block doesn't mean you have to walk the cows to the other end of the farm. It's important yeah. to what I would regard as having probably a lame field or, or maybe a, a little paddock near, you know, the parlor that the cow hasn't to walk that far. Because if the cows are indoors, then would would a straw bed be a kind of a good option for them? Well, a straw bed will be a help, but they don't necessarily need a straw bed if you you know follow the procedure. Get mm. both, both, both equally high and then um, apply a block. Because in, in indoor systems, if you have enough of cubicles, the cows will have, you know, comfort of the cubicles with mats and that, the cows will be able to lie down. Yeah. So yeah. I suppose. Just to make the distinction, I suppose, Ned, the white line is more a disease of, of walking uh, to grazing pastures. And so it also is more of, a, more of an issue when cows are indoors on, on a hard circuit. Of course, yeah. You will always. I know what I've done. I've do, I've done training in. Yeah, I I do it in a herd that, that have, you know, five or six hundred cows indoors, and they have yeah. a much higher level of of soil ulcers in their herd than a white line. Yeah, a, a very little white line because white line is generally associated with with with, with roadways, with cows walking, with 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 handling of cows and move, movement of cows. Okay. Now, is there a role for the use of anti-inflammatories? Um, for, for pain relief and all that kind of stuff when the cow is being treated? Of course, yeah. I mean, again, I suppose, you know, I, that wouldn't be my end because I, I'm like a vet. 
like would generally, you know, maybe, you know, where you have a bit of swelling in, in, in the claw, you would recommend to the farmer that he gets his vet to uh, to look at that and to put it in and to, to, to get, okay. to get results. Good. Okay. So, now, I suppose the third thing that I'm going to talk about is a disease, again, as I said, is known as digital dermatitis or mortalar disease. Now, I suppose in Ireland at the moment, it's on a vast amount of health. It's in a lot of health. The one single thing about it, it's, it's very painful. It's easily recognized. So it's important that you recognize this if you see it and that you start to treat it immediately, simply because it's very, very contagious. And I suppose we're coming up to the time of the year where cows are starting to go indoors and mortal air or digital dermatitis will spread much easily indoors where animals are overcrowded, where they're standing in slurry and those are the, I suppose, the places that are conducive to the spread of this, of this, of this, uh, of this disease. So okay. like, how do we treat this? What we do is first of all, we lift the foot and we clean it. And then we apply a spray. You can get an antibiotic spray or a epidermis spray. Those sprays are good to do it. In the case of what we have here on our left hand side, it would, I would actually bandage this cow with a gel, a suitable gel that's available. There's a lot of different products available out there for, for this, uh, this disease or this problem. And um, the one single biggest thing about uh, digital dermatitis or mortalara, if you have it in the herd and you don't have it under control, if you get problems like sole ulcers and white line damage, this disease can actually go on those sole ulcers and white line and it won't allow to cure. So you end up with secondary infections. And like, I think it's very, very important that any farmer that has this in his herd, that he uses a foot bat. And he uses a foot bat, first of all, to drive down the level of infection he has in the herd before the cows start to go in full time. I would recommend, you know, and I mean, I suppose I want to be asked the question, how often do you foot bat? You know, you need to do that while the cows are out grazing at least once a week. And while before they go indoors and while they're outside, you need to do it a couple of times a week, depending on the level of infection. If you have a disease, second, sorry, John. The second question to be asked there, Ned, is the first one is how often? And the second question is which foot bath solution would you recommend? Well, I suppose, George, in fairness, there's a, there's a hundred different foot bath solutions out there. Yeah. And uh, like the most important thing is, as, <clears throat> as I said, a farm asked me before that exact questions, and I said the most important thing to put into a foot bath is the cow. Because yeah. there's a lot of people out there and they don't use a foot bath. There's a lot of products out there available. They'll all do what they say on the tin as long as you follow the correct instructions. I had issues with farmers that weren't good, getting good results from particular products. And the first question I asked them was, how much water was in the foot bath? I'm not sure. How much product did you put in? I put in a half the drum. But really, mm -hmm. you need to put in the correct rate to the rate of water to get the best results. And I and didn't put that way. Yeah, it's absolutely vital, George. It's absolutely vital that you, if you have this problem in your herd, in order to control it and to drive down the level of infection, you have to put rate of cows. It's a simple enough thing to compare to if I have a cow with mastitis, what do I do? I lift her and treat her. What do I do to prevent the spread of mastitis? I teeth it. Now, farmers teeth tape every single day. Why? Because they don't want to get mastitis. Really and truly, I mean, foot bathing, if there's a problem in the herd, really and truly, farmers should be foot bathing most days. And like, it's not a huge cost, but relative to what lame cows are. So if you haven't matalera or digital damages in your herd, you don't need to foot bath. And it's important to keep your herd closed. In other words, try not to buy in animals and try not, especially by men animals that might have this problem, because unless you recognize it, it'll end up spreading through your hand. And I have a lot of experience with that. So I suppose going on to our next slide, what can we do to minimize the risk to the hoofs? In other words, what can you as a farmer do for yourself in order to reduce the level of lameness in your herd? So we'll talk first about cow-friendly environment. In other words, what we, we want to talk about is roadways. Mm. In grazing herds, I suppose the single most important part of, of I suppose, a cow producer milk is getting grass. And in order to get grass, she has to walk from point A to point B and generally using a roadway. Now, it's so important that you have good roadways, you maintain good quality roadways, and of course, make sure that 
if you have a rotary that you have a camper on it. In other words, that there's a camper from the middle, not from one side, uh, from the middle that the water can run off to allow, I suppose, the roadways to stay as dry and clean as possible. The other very important thing about roadways, and I know, George, you're going to get someone to discuss it, I think, in a couple of weeks' time, is that roadways should never be made along by, you could say, under, under trees or maybe along by a ditch or a hedge. Because if you make roadways along by a ditch and a hedge, they generally tend to be stay wet. So the most important parts of a roadway is actually at the start of a roadway, on bends, and at the end of a roadway. Simply because when a cow walks from one surface, from concrete, we say, onto a roadway, they often tend to stop. Like they're not going to walk straight from one surface. And when cow tends, tends to stop, they tend to dome. So we have a bigger level of, of, of dirt around that end. When cows come to a bend, unless you have a decent bend on the roadway, cows tend to stop again. Again, mm. they tend to dome. So you have a higher level of problems there. So the, I suppose roadways are vital to reduce the level of lameness in a grazing dairy had good roadways. The second yeah. thing is I would talk about is collecting yards. Like for the last number of years, there've been a big increase in the number of cows, I suppose, in Ireland especially, but infrastructure hasn't increased relative to the number of cows. <laughs> so collecting yards generally need to be, you need to have an office space in your collecting yard. I think 1.5 meters per cow is, is, yeah. is what they recommend. I think that's why you charged it. So like, yeah. because, yeah. Because cows, cows generally, they have a walking order and they have a milking order. And cows that maybe go into the, you could say the collecting yard first, might be the first to want to go get meat. And maybe the ones that come in the middle of the end. So they have to struggle maybe in a crowded milking parlour from the back of, of, of the collecting yard through the cows and up to get meat. So, so like if there's not enough space, you'll find that you know, there's a lot of shearing, there's a lot of, 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 I suppose, tearing of the hoofs on the concrete. You end up with, you know, damaging, separating the white line, which will end up getting damaged when the cows go back out again. So that's a very important point. Housing, from a housing point of view, I'd be recommending that you have a cubicle per cow. Now, I know this is probably the situation on some farmers, but not on, on enough farms. So... You, that, that is the first thing. The second thing, that you have enough of feed space. You have enough of feed space that all the cows can eat together. Because mm -hmm. what you have to understand about cows, cows are actually hard animals. How do you mess with a cow's head? You put one not doing, one half doing one thing and one half doing the other thing. So when cows are eating, they all actually want to eat together. So they need to be enough of, if they want to eat, they need to be able to stand up from the cubicles, a comfortable cubicle maybe with, you know, this matting, go and eat, and then maybe get a drink of water or whatever and, and lie down. And this will reduce, I suppose, the stress or the pressure on the feet or on the hoofs. Because when, when a cow is standing, she's putting a lot of pressure, especially on the bone in the cow, which she will end up getting bruised, number one. And number two, uh, end up with a sole ulcer, which we have actually seen and we spoke about there, George. You asked the question, is there mm -hmm. a bigger level of uh, sole ulcers indoors? Of course there is. I suppose yeah. the, third, the third important thing or the fourth important thing there, which is very, very important from a digital dermatitis point of view or martillero point of view, is hygiene. It's very mm -hmm. important that you keep your cubicles as clean as possible, that you keep your yards as clean as possible, that you, if you have automatic scrapers, that you keep those scrapers working regular and don't allow a, a build-up or pool of slurry that the cow is standing in and passing on, I suppose, um, you know, disease from one cow to the other. The other important thing, as we said about the housing, if you're overcrowded, if there's too many cows inside, you know, and there's not enough of cubicles, you tend to have higher level of stress, consequently a higher, very high level of, uh, of multilateral disease. Yeah. So housing and the hygiene and the collecting air are so important. Cow management is a very, is another very important part of min, min, minimizing the risk. So I would always start off and I talk to in a farmer if he had a high level of um, lameness in the herd, um, how he was handling his cows, how he walked his cows from the paddock to the yard for milking. Was he using a dog? Was he using a quad? You know, and I suppose cows are smart enough animals. They like to walk. They like to have their head down when they're walking. Where they place their front leg, they automatically place their back leg. So that means there's no cow want to walk on a stone because it's going to hurt them. 
So she'd walk where there's no stone and she'd place her back leg in the same place. So but if she's been, we'll say, pushed along, hunted along by a quad or a dog, her head is up on the cow in front of her, she can't see what she's doing. And consequently, you will end up with uh, a higher level of names. What I would suggest to farmers, especially if they have bigger numbers of cows and their cows are walking good distances, I would suggest a thing called a backlatch. Now, a backlatch, some of you might know what it is. And what a backlatch is, is actually an automatic gap opening. And you can actually walk it from your phone to open maybe a couple of hours before you want to go milking. You know, maybe in the, in the morning, you could set it to open at five o'clock if you want to go meeting at, at seven. And I know dealing with farmers, um, you know, and I had just a simple story. I had three or four farmers that had a good level of lameness after increasing their cows, you know, in the last couple of years. And the, the one thing I just asked them to do was all to put in a backlash. And I spoke to them all afterwards and they said, we definitely had a less lame cows as a result because they found, you know, the cows will get up and most of them are, probably on their way to the milk and parlour. There's no pressure on them. Um, and all you have to do is go and collect the last handful of cows. You're not hunting a couple of hundred cows down a roadway trying to get them in for milking. So, so it reduces the stress, the stress of the feed, the level of white line damage, and the level of lameness. Um, and the second important point there is walking cows after calving. I think, you know, Generally, when after a cow calf, before a cow calves or as she's going to calve, she there's a she actually produces a hormone in her back end that allows the back canal to open, and it relaxes the back canal. But what it does also, it actually relaxes the 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 the, the bone. The bone is 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 held or suspended in the hoof, and it relaxes that bone, and that bone can actually drop, and it drop and it kind of pinches the quick. Now straight after calving. If we allow, you know, cows to have walk long distances, what may happen or what can happen is that this bone is not actually going back, gone back into place. It takes three or four days for, you know, all that our system to get back correct after calving. You can end up with three or four weeks later or six weeks later with sore bruising and consequently sore losses. So yeah. I, what I would suggest and recommend for farmers that are walking cows or have a lot of cows calf, is try and have keep the cows that you know have just calved, keep them near for maybe five to six days or a week. Try and have a few paddocks around local. I know it, it, it's not that easy all the time, but it's important you do it if you want to kind of drive down the level of lameness in your hand. I so suppose the other option then, the other option there is to probably keep them in for a few days after calving in pasture-based systems, you know, leave them in, in close to the parlor you know, in a shed there beside it. Um, I think that's I think that's very important. I think I think is is to once you get a system in place, you know, that you can actually, you know, reduce, I suppose, you know, what what how far the cows have to walk or how far the cows have to go, especially after calving, will help okay. in all the thing. Because everything I'm talking about here is, is a package. I mean every small yeah. thing you do will will help in reducing the level of lameness. Another important thing is uh, introducing heifers, and I think it's important to do it from what I see, that they're introduced into the main herd before they care, because you can understand what happens to a cow at calving. She may have a big calf, number one. Number two, then she's been brought in to be milked. She's been handled different. She's stressed. And then she's maybe been bullied because she, she doesn't, she hasn't been introduced into the main herd before before she calves. And maybe she's not allowed to go get a drink of water, maybe she's not allowed to go feed. So consequently, she end up with different problems and, and feed problems because she's kind of, uh, I suppose her feet are way on, she's moving more, she's turning more, she's trying to get out of the way of, of, the, of the bully cows and that stuff. So, like, if we can probably, we can do very little about, I suppose, our calf and the milking, but maybe we can do something about, you know, uh, the bullying end of it or, or that end of it to reduce the stress on that heifer. Mm. Uh, now, I suppose from a lameness program point of view, you know, it's another way of minimizing the risk to the hoof. I would be suggesting, and I know I spoke about early on, that anyone yeah. has a problem with digital dermatitis that you have to foot bed. And using a foot bed, it's important that if, if foot bed is an issue or a problem or a chore, farmers are not, not inclined to do it. So I would suggest that farmers either build their own foot bed, a concrete foot bed, that the cows 
like building a food pack or never build a food pack you, you step down into. Always build a food pack that the cows have to step up into. They prefer to do it. Or you can buy you can buy a concrete food pack. There's there's a lot of the, the agri stores now are selling selling concrete food packs. Um, I don't believe that the plastic food pack is is correct. First of all, it's too small. It makes a lot of noise. The 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 food pack at the end has ridges, and you can imagine if I have so up bees, I don't want to be walking on ridges. So, mm -hmm. like it's it, it's it's very important to have a good food bed and program in place. As I said, you food bed your cows at least once a week while they're out grazing and before they're introduced into the housing system that you up that and while they're inside, you continue to do that to drive down the level of infection. Um, the second thing, very, very important, early detection and treatment. So it's so, so important that when you see a lamb cow that you treat her immediately, if possible. Now, I know in situations it might be difficult enough to get a vet or difficult enough to get a foot trimmer, but like maybe hopefully down the line that, you know, that some of the younger guys coming out, out, out of different programs will have, be able to actually recognise maybe a problem and be able to deal with this, this lame cow as she comes and then get any foot trimmer to do uh, right foot trimmer. Uh, yeah. That is so important because if a cow is neglected and... Um, she ends up getting chronically lame. You get a lot of damage to the foot. And then the farmer said to you, oh, did you treat it all again last last month or the month before? Of course I did, because she's going to be a continuous problem, simply because it had the problem had become chronic and you can't cure it. It's the very same as if any ever broke your nail or that, you'll always find there's a bit of weakness there. There's always a weakness where that damage is done. So it's yeah. so important, early detection, early treatment, early recovery, more money in your pocket. And I would always suggest that any farmer, with, especially with a larger number of cows, can mobility score their cows because the bigger the numbers, the harder to detect cows getting laid. Going back in our time, I suppose, George, there was always only 10 or 12 cows in a farm. And I suppose they, we even knew, knew them by names. But now there's two or 300 cows on a farm, which is a completely different um, situation. And um, you have to mobility score. I mean, farmers can learn how to do that. There's a, there's a ROMS course that has been done from England. You can do it online. But if you understand how to do it, you can easily take out the cows in time before they get too lame and get them trimmed to prevent them coming to the, the stage where they, they become very, very lame. So um, so those are the, are the what I would be suggesting to all farmers to help them on their farms to reduce the level of lameness in their herd. Question in there, uh, Ned. Are black soled hoofs less likely to be prone to lameness? I, I believe I believe they are. They, they just tend to be. They, but, but at the end of the day, George, a lot of it will depend on conditions. Even if you're black soles or any color soles, you know, if the cows are walking long distances, if you have poor roadways, you still tend to have a, a good level of lameness. But definitely, you will always find if you lift a hoof, it can be black and it can be white as well, can be both of them. And generally, the pigment of the black hook tend to be just that little bit harder. And if it's harder, it's less susceptible to, to damage. Okay. So I suppose I'm going to look here. The, my take home message really to everyone listening here in here today is first of all, have a good lameness program in place. So, what I mean by that is if you have digital dermatitis or mortal on your herb, you have to put bait. And you have to put bait regular, and you can't say, ah, I'll give it a skip this week, because if you give it a skip this week and next week, you'll find that the level of infection has increased and you're back to stage one again. Farmers that are walking cows long distances, roadways are so, so important. Keep your, do your roadways, keep them as good as possible, um, because at the end of the day, it's so important for the cow, if she's traveling long distances from, from the milking power to the field, that the roadways are good. And I would suggest as well is if at all possible, try and keep heavy machinery off your own mm -hmm. Often on silage time, you see uh, big tractors and trailers driving mad up and down roadways, tearing up the roadways, doing a lot of damage. And it costs tens of thousands to, to actually put in roadways. It's very easy to, I suppose, um, you know, get rid of that 10,000 by that. I would suggest drop wires inside the roadway and leave the, leave the trailers pass up and down beside the roadway to reduce 
uh, as opposed to the level of damage that these, these tractors and trailers can do. Uh, the other very important thing is animal handling. I think it's very, very important that either your herdsmen or yourself that there's an SOP in place, standard operating procedure on how to handle your animals. In other words, no sticks, no shouting, move your animals nice and quiet along, and you'll find you will have a lot less lameness. I also spoke about a bat latch. I would recommend any farmer to try using it. Any farmer I know has been using it. They said it's one of the best investments they've made. There's a, a, a question in here, Tony, and the first thing he's, the person says is that he can highly recommend the battle actually put one in earlier this year. His uh, question is, uh, would you recommend having the entire herd hoof paired once a year? I, I, would, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say trimmed. I would say inspected because you, you could get it done. Like the, thing about, the thing about, I suppose, and what is happening, I suppose, nationally and even internationally is if you if you um if you put in a cow to be and a and, and a hoof trimmer ends up trimming them and maybe not need a trim and you could end up with lambs. I would suggest that you really you do a mobility score on your herd and you actually book your, your foot trimmer maybe every month to come in to do a number of animals. And yeah. as a result you'll probably get through trimming most of your cows through the year. Your cows that have overgrown feet of course have to be trimmed. But like I would definitely uh, recommend it not touching cows that have correct feet, because if you're trimming and you go out and you could end up making their soles too thin and end up, um, you know, going lame. Because a lot of foot trimmers are actually using grinders and that, and like if you touch a grinder off a hoof that doesn't need it, you end up taking something you're taking off. You can't put it back on, George. You know what I mean? So yeah. I would. I, I wouldn't say. Um, I suppose uh, a full hard trim. I say a full hard inspection, which is a completely different thing. Inspect the feed, but maybe not trim. Yeah. Um, I suppose the next thing there again is very, very important is early detection and treatment. You know, if if the cow is lame, lift her. Maybe she has only a problem with martillaire disease. That's why it's important to recognize different problems like white lion or sore ulcers. And like most farmers can get a can of spray or whatever or put on a bandage and, and spray that, that lesion, and you'll find that you'll get results. Um, and Ned, the question in on that. What would you use uh, in the dressing? Um, uh, yeah. Say, for example, for Martellaro in particular, maybe. Well, in Martellaro, there's there's a lot there's a there's a, there's a lot of different uh, there's a lot of different um, you know um, I suppose things out there. There's a there's a wipey down the gel. Uh, you can get it. You can also get there's there's a lot of I suppose here in Ireland, especially a lot of people that that sell hoof care products. There's paste that I use myself. It's actually a paste of salicylic sal acid and, and blue stone. It's mixed together and I, I bandage it. You get good results. So I suppose really what I would say to whatever area you're in is maybe go to your local, maybe agri store and most of them do stock, um, you know, or some of them do stock the products that are available. They'll all do what they say on the tin. What's very, very important if you're bandaging a cow that you only leave on the bandage two days. If you leave it on longer, sometimes you can end up with the cow going very lame because the bandage will stop the blood supply in the hoof and end up maybe with the hoof gone now. So always, always, if you bandage a cow, that you take off the bandage within two to three days maximum. Yeah. Um, so it depends. So basically what you're saying is uh, treat them promptly. There's a, a, a variety of different generic products available to include. You're using salicylic acid and um, yeah, blue bluestone in your yeah. bandage. Yeah. With, with good effect. And this came in from um, a listener from Kiel, so in Germany. So I, I suppose we don't, um, yeah. we wouldn't know exactly what they'd be selling over there, Ned. Yeah, well, I, well, I do. I know that Repidama, the Repidama gel is over there as well. So um, like, there, there, there is so many products. And I mean, the problem is there's new, there's more and more products coming on the market. Mm -hmm. All the time. Like I say, and they make it not to leave it on for too long anyway. Not to leave it, because all these products will work. All, as long as they if you, you, you read what it says on the tin, it's like, what do you put into a foot bath? You read what it says on the tin and you use you use a card in it. And once you do that, you will get results. But it's so important that the early detection, so the minute you see it, you treat it, you get the best results. So, yeah. and I suppose, you know, the last part on that slide is less lameness equals increased profits. A lot of common sense in that. If a hundred cow had, if it's costing you 10 or 12,000 euros in lameness, or 200 cow had, it's costing you 20,000. What do you want to do? 
you want to reduce the level of lameness in that heart so that, of course, you can uh, increase the money in your back pocket. And that's so important. So, so I suppose my last slide then is questions and answers. Um, there is there is a tree. Can you see the chats there, George? Yeah, yeah. We've answered as we went along, Ned. There's not, okay. nothing else is dropping. Yeah. So, if there, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Yaris. Thanks, Yaris. Yaris is very good um, practical advice there, uh, Ned. So, if I could leave you with one question, Ned. Thanks, Yaris. If I could leave you with one question there, uh, Ned, it would be if you could only do one thing to reduce lameness in grazing herds, oh, what would it be? Well, I, I suppose I would put one with you. I would say, I would say number one is put in a backlash and train your 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 um your staff or yourself how to handle animals. Handling of animals is vital. I know it from experience. I've seen it from experience. Herds herds that have issues with lameness, especially in grazing herds, are guys that maybe spend more time shouting at animals and moving them too fast. Yeah. And having patience. You have to have patience. I mean, at the end of the day, what you everyone must realize here is the cow is your bread and butter. She's making the money for you. You need to look yeah. after her. Okay. And a question in from someone from John here. Should the hoof pair skim off the bare minimum? The, the, the hoof trimmer should examine the, the foot. Yeah. And if she needs to be trimmed, he'll trim her. If she doesn't, he shouldn't touch her. Yeah. And that is the reality. You should never trim a, a foot, and especially an inner claw. The inner claw, in 99% of the time, should never be touched unless it's overgrown. If you trim an inner claw, you actually lower it. So it's much harder for you to, to uh, move the weight. What we try to do when we're foot trimming is move the weight from the overgrown claw, which is the outer claw, onto the inner claw. But if I, if I lower the inner claw, it's much harder to do that. And often you'll end up trying to do that and maybe over trimming the outer claw. So yeah. the one thing I would say about foot trimming is if you take it off, you can't put it back on. But if you don't, if you don't take it off, you can always go back again and examine it again and take a little bit more off. So yeah. I, I would always suggest is just, you know, when you're foot trimming cows, always examine them. And it's so, so important as well as if you get wet weather, and especially this time of the year, a lot of the feet are very warm. There's very little. I mean, all you can do at the moment this time of the year when cows are walking is treat your lame cows. You can't trim feet. Because yeah. if cows are still walking, their feet are wearing more than they're growing, and you're going to end up with very thin soles. Consequently, you're going to end up with more lame cows. Yeah. Question there in Ned, what's the cost of the bat latch? The bat latch, I think, is something in the region of 500 euros, give or take. Now, I I suppose think... if, if we put it in context of one lane cow or two lane cows, it's a great investment. There's yeah, two variations of them there, George. There's, uh, um, yeah. you can get it. I think 400 is probably the lowest I've seen them advertised for, which is the standard one, which is the set to timer that Ned is talking about. And then there's right. a that can be actually triggered by a mobile phone, which has a SIM card included, and that's nearly 700 or 750. Yeah, exactly. That's my understanding too. Yeah. So there's a bit of variation there now, depending on how sophisticated you want them. Exactly. But, 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 but I mean, the but Ned's point, I suppose, George, is that the, in the overall scheme of things, they're very cheap relatively. Yeah. Absolutely. Two yeah. cases to buy any of them. Yeah. Uh, what's well, actually a very good idea there, Stuart and George, in a bat latches. You'll buy a bat latch. What I have got guys to do, and I actually stood and watched, you know, I suppose the first week, well, not the first week, but the first day of the bat latch in a place. I got them to put in um, a, a gallon and I cut the top out of it, and there were stones in it. So when the bat latch opened across, I went back and it made a noise the same as a bell. And the next thing mm. you can see the cow is standing up and they're looking around. So it was the same as an alarm bell. A few of them will start to move towards the gap. And then, mm. you know, cows will follow one another. And once you get a few in, you won't, might get them all, but you most definitely yeah. will get enough of them to reduce the pressures while they're walking when you're hunting. Them. Yeah, absolutely. And then they're coming in, choosing the space and coming in at the one time. Listen, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for your attendance there. Look, at Ned, we've gone on. A little bit longer than we'd anticipate initially. Um, I suppose the core things uh, you cover there are the costs, which is 200 a case, or around 10,000 a year in the average farm. Um, and if you were given a choice of one thing, you said that would be around the whole area of handling cows and using the bat latch to try and reduce the stress on cows and the pressure that you're putting on them are coming in. 
And with no further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we thank you uh, very much for your attendance. I look forward to talking to you again and presenting again to you in, in a week's time. Thank you very much. And thanks so much, Ned, for your, for your contribution. Thanks very much, George. Thank you.